uh, called Jono Naylor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'd just like to pick up where my colleague Chris Bishop has left off, uh, which is around Clause 10. Uh, I've got some different uh, points around Clause 10 that I'd like to make than the ones that, that he was looking for. But I think um, one of the difficulties about the double action ability was uh, the double action ability nature um, where Clause 10 is looking to remove uh, the double action ability rule um, is, is very important. And uh, if anyone you know, was paying attention, which they probably weren't to my second reading speech, uh, and we look as to where that, um, that, that double action ability rule first evolved from, it actually came uh, right back in 1870 where there was a rogue uh, Jamaican governor who actually managed to then hide behind this double action ability rule um, uh, based on the fact that he had been engaged in some pretty outrageous uh, acts of flogging um, and, 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 and executing and imprisoning people without really much cause. And of course, by the time he'd retreated back to the UK, uh, managed to hide behind um, the laws of both countries. And so I think. Uh, it's, it's clearly important to me that, that Clause 10 actually, in getting away from there needing to be um, an actionable uh, legislation in both the country in which it occurred and back here in New Zealand for you to be able to take a, uh, 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 an action against somebody is very important. Because otherwise, again, if, for example, uh, there were two New Zealanders who um, something had gone down overseas, uh, if, if it didn't meet the threshold of double action ability, as is the case now, the only option available to that person, of course, would be to take uh, legal action um, against that person in the jurisdiction where it occurred. Now, if you've got a New Zealander wanting to take action against another New Zealander um, in, in a foreign jurisdiction, that's entirely and completely difficult. Um, and not to mention the fact that um, the, that jurisdiction may not have an ability to apply anything to the offending party anyway. So uh, it was, that would always have been a long shot. So I think what by getting rid of the double action ability rule we are making is a, a very clear statement that actually if you are in a country you contravene that uh, country's laws and you cause harm to another person, you can be liable for that in New Zealand regardless of New Zealand law. And I think that is a very, um, very uh, useful part uh, of this legislation is to remove that double actionability rule. Um, Clause 7 is, is also particularly uh, interesting in that it establishes a general rule uh, which is focused on the place of wrongdoing. Now, as I just mentioned when talking about Clause 10, um, it's actually where that occurs. Now, there is different elements uh, involved in this. So clearly, it means that the law will be applied to the case where the law um, of the jurisdiction of where it occurred will apply and, and where the events that give rise to the claim occur. Where, uh, the, the difficulty is, though, is where different elements of the questionable events may have occurred in different countries. And so this new rule, this new general rule, is split into three parts. So for personal injury, uh, the law of the country where the personal injury or death occurred applies. And I think it's important to note that this does not affect uh, New Zealand's ACC uh, provisions. Uh, secondly, uh, the, for actions that relate to damage to property, again, it's the law of the country where the property was when it was damaged. So the property doesn't need to be owned uh, in that country, but for example, if, if I had take, if, 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 if it was property that I owned here, whether it be some sort of, uh, I don't know what it is, you take overseas a camera or whatever it was, um, but if, if, if uh, it, it, it's where the, where the property was at the time uh, when the questionable event occurred. Um, and then the hazy part, I guess, needs also needed clarity, and that is in the third part where it talks about um, in any other case, the law of the country where the most significant element or elements of the events that give rise to the action applies. So that's where the majority of the actionable behaviour occurred. It's within that um, jurisdiction that applies. So if there was something that was ongoing that uh, occurred in multiple uh, jurisdictions, then of course um, it would then be up to the court to determine where the majority of it had occurred, where most of it had occurred, um, in order to be able to uh, ensure 
ultimately that um, there is an ability for that action uh, to take place. Um, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there is, of course, an exception to this uh, general rule because, of course, whenever you have a general rule, there's always bound to be an exception somewhere along the line. And so Clause 8 um, actually provides for this. Uh, and so by virtue of Clause 8, the court then is allowed to apply the law of another country where it is substantially more appropriate to do so. So what this does is it actually gives the judiciary some discretion um, to assess the merits of applying the law of a different country on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think um, it, it, we've talked uh, in the previous uh, bill that we were talking about at committee stage about the importance of having flexibility, that when things are simply done in a hard and fast way, um, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, tortious acts, um, there is always going to be a certain level of grey area. So it's important for the judiciary to be able to have some discretion um, to assess the merits of applying different law um, in the country on a case-by-case -case basis. And so the courts, when doing this, obviously don't just have a carte blanche ability to do it at will or whenever they like, but they must consider that the significance of the factors that connect a tort with the country whose law would be the applicable law under the general rule and the significance of any factors connecting the tort with any other country. So it's not just a, a random thought, that, and not that I, I'm sure our judiciary ever just have random thoughts, because they are very well-considered people, uh, but what they have to do is actually weigh up the significance of any factors that they may have if they want to apply this exception to the general rule. So, Mr Chair, uh, Ultimately, I think what we have is, um, again, a piece of legislation, um, I think, uh, initially put together. We, we keep lauding uh, uh, the Honourable David Benner for his work uh, on this, but I think uh, uh, Chris Ockenvold actually had a, a bit of a part to play in this as well uh, before he left at the uh, end of the 50th Parliament. Uh, Dave Bennett, Honourable Dave Bennett uh, picked it up, and, of course, uh, Sarah Dowie has taken it through. We have got, I think, a piece of legislation that will make it easier for New Zealanders who have had wrongs done to them outside of New Zealand to be able to take action to actually rectify uh, and bring some closure to them and to uh, bring some sort of remedial actions through the courts to make up for any losses, any injuries or any damage that they've had to property. And so, uh, Mr Chair, it's great to see that there's been such good support for this and I look forward uh, to the third reading of the bill. Chair. I call uh, Maureen Pugh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh